Hi, everyone. Thank you, Adina. Um, OK, so like Adina said, we'll have a bunch of talks together in a session and then a kind of Q&A panel discussion session after that. And the talks are 20 minutes each. And um, we told the speakers they can decide if they want to have questions in their 20 minutes, that's fine, or they can just postpone it until the panel discussion. So the first speaker I would like to introduce, who has already kind of introduced himself, is Jarek. Uh, so welcome, Jarek. <laughs> Jaroslav is uh, one of the founding uh, fa fathers of DataLab, and he's leading the Center for Open Neuroscience at Dartmouth College in the USA, where he's a research associate professor. The motto of the center is, together we can make neuroscience a better science, and that is what Jarek lives by. In various collaborations, he develops and contributes to various open source software and standard projects to improve efficiency and reproducibility in neuroscience and beyond. So please welcome Jarek. show you this. In this yeah, that would be great. Any questions so far? Are you having a good time? No? Okay. So then let's begin with the next talk and it will be pretty much a little bit of excursion into data lab and how that project kind of was born and how it developed. Uh, but let me start with kind of common question, why version control? Different people have different ideas and how they use it. For me, it's all those plus more. Let's say we collaborate. That's like original idea for using any version control. So you work together with somebody else and you can merge changes, right? And then keep things organized because it forces you to organize your stuff so you don't just pollute stuff, uh, pollute your version control systems with some arbitrary files. And synchronization, right? So in Git Annex, there is Assistant, let's say, which allows you to synchronize even automatically, which I started to use for one of the projects. It's just amazing. Keep track of changes. That's your version control 101, kind of. But then experiment. To experiment with version control is really easy. It's your time machine, right? You do something, you might commit it or you might not commit it, reset hard, right? So it gives you that ability to experiment, create branches, throw them away, right? Which is otherwise you just can't do reliably because then you just end up in a mess where you don't know one from another. And um, use as a backup. Uh, I'll show that in Dendy, we pretty much started to use data like, just to back up our data into uh, Dropbox through our clone connection of Git Annex. And search. I don't use grep, I use git grep because it then grabs only through the files which matter for me and not all the rest like virtual environments and stuff. So what is your use case? Is anything missing here? Do you have any other kind of really good idea of why version control for you? No? I was that exhaustive. Uh-huh. Right, right, right. Sometimes, yeah. I, I, well, Git Annex is that kind of evil, right? So Git Annex has that branch of its own thing, right? Which is unrelated per se to original tree, but uh, having different, yeah, Git has that ability. Okay, anything else? Doing a sneaker net if you have uh, locations that are not connected at all or just very badly uh, so that you can still keep an overview where things are or maybe if you have a backup in the safe, for example. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's built in in Git Annex pretty much. You have those locations and Git Annex info. Yeah, that's true. Kind of those uh, things are connected leading to a thing called GitOps. So where you use a Git repository as your source of truth. GitOps. For, yeah. That's a nice word. Um, it's, it's not my word. <laughs> um, so if you uh, use Git as uh, the source, for example, <clears throat> for example, to create infrastructure as code, mm -hmm. and you want to deploy infrastructure from that, you need some kind of truth somewhere, and Git is pretty good for that because of keeping tracking changes, etc. Okay, cool. 
Oh man, we could go. Okay, I'll, I'll continue with my talk. I, I didn't expect <laughs> even to be that prolific. Okay, but that's great. We should chat about it. We'll be here and maybe talk about uh, those use cases more. But let's continue with version control. If you start Googling version control, the history ends in 2005. So that's when pretty much like Git and Mercurial and Bizarre, they kind of appeared, right? And you, you, this is one of the exam exemplar timelines, which I kind of liked. Uh, there is attribution you could find where uh, it originates for, from. For us, it began also somewhere in 2007 when we, uh, 2005 Git was invented, kind of, right? Uh, we used SVN and CVS before that. First commit in PyMVPA, one of our projects, was in 2007 in May. Then GitHub was founded only a year after. So we were pre-GitHub era. And then first commit in Gitanix happened in 2010, and first commit in data led 2013. And it wasn't even named data led, but GitWeb at that time. And what was original use case for me was I had this collection of Soviet time cartoons I grew up with, and they're all on the web and with URLs. So I wanted to put them, of course, to be managed in, by the tool I use, Git, right? And I've discovered Gitanix. So how could I put all that into version control? So uh, it's like not zoomed in, but Git web was really simple. It scrapes the website, it calls git annex at URL, uh, which calls git, and then we git commit, and that's it. And then user can git annex get that file. And amazingly, it still works. I found that repository on my hard drive. It had to go through git annex upgrades, but then it managed to get that file eventually. It was slow, it was, I don't know, from what kind of medium it was fetching, which is another amazing part of Gitanix that you could add stuff, multiple connections, and then it just gets it done, right? It, you don't care where it comes sometimes, right? Uh, <laughs> as long as it comes and it's what you want, right? And another use case we had really, we have a project NeuroDebian where we manage and package neuroscience software for Debian operating system, and we wanted to do the same for data. But the problem with data was that it's, it's it's not really, technologies of distributed version control systems or version control systems, they weren't good for data, right? So, uh, and let's say you couldn't put tarballs into version control system, right? You cannot put tarballs, you cannot manage data in tarballs. You change one readme and what, new gigabyte tarball? It doesn't work, right? Uh, so it was inefficient to distribute through tarballs, absent versioning of data, you saw the initial slide, right? So it's like, uh, code version control, not, in a, not adequate. And another, pro not problem actually, glory, is that terabytes of data were already shared, right? So they're available online and we cannot just make a copy, right? Because we will not scale to make copy of all data resources out there. So we need to think about something else. And um, there were no generic data distributions. If there were, then we would just jump on that bandwagon. And another problem is like every website wanted to use their own way to authenticate. So it wasn't even the, to the date. They might have their own ways to authenticate, their own ways to say, no, you have to log in, right? So it, it will not be 403 code. It will be just into your face. Please enter your password here. So how do we interface to them in a standard way? Then absent data testing, quite a number of projects in uh, neuroimaging, they were um, buggy data, so we have to really keep that in mind, and it was difficult to share derived data. So, okay, back in 2013, I wrote Joy email, which is pretty much like, do you want to work on federal funds? <laughs> and through some discussion, we agreed that it's a good idea, right? So we filed a um, proposal, we started to work on proposal with Michael in January, it's like, and then we submitted it, and in June, July, we've got some feedback, and in September, we started to work on Datalet. So it was quite amazing for us that it was our first grant proposal, which was, got funded, and we became PIs and leading that project, so it was really great. And for Joy, I think it was really nice, so he could continue developing his tool. So for us, it became kind of also a way to embrace uh, open source projects where we don't just use them or abuse them, but we're also trying to contribute back even just to kind of do this, oh, let's do it together. Um, so there is many improvements in Gitanix since then, but for us, critical ones became standardization of interfaces with the tool. So again, bridging the islands, right? So we don't want to 
redevelop everything, like create ad hoc solutions, but we started to work together. So let's say Git Annex got batch mode, got JSON interface between. So when we invoke, there is standard language to talk to Git Annex. And another huge improvement, or not improvement, but development was those special remote protocol, right? So Joy came up with the protocol and initial use cases were our data led special remote to access those resources with non-standard authentication schemes. So we created our special remote to access uh, CRCNS, their authentication, Nitrix, all those, and data-led archives, because most of data resources, they shared tarballs. Sometimes it was layout, overlay of tarballs, like, oh, this is the main tarball, then you extract this tarball on top. So it was kind of messy, and we needed a way, so for a user it looks just a tree, and then we get data from corresponding tarball as necessary. So instead of that simple picture now for a user to get the file, what came into the sandwich, data led get file calls git annex get file, that one calls git annex remote data led archive, which gets the, the archive, and then it calls git annex remote data led to get authenticated tarball, like connection. So through establishing those standard mechanisms to interface, we created this abomination but it solved our problem, right? So again, baby steps, right? But it overall, it provided a solution which is modular enough so we could just mix and match and accomplish the deal for most of the projects which we worked with. So uh, another piece of component, if you look back into, the, oh, that's too little. I thought to show you the code. Aye. Okay, um, so crawler, uh, was developed so you could pretty much crawl any website and it provided you custom solutions to establish pipelines, and there was a code there, um, establish pipelines to download incoming data in its tarballs. So that's the branch, talking about branches. This is kind of timeline of many projects and data-led repositories which we have where data comes into incoming branch uh, then it gets processed, like tarball gets extracted into incoming process data branch, and then we merge those changes with maybe any other changes in master branch. And in, in process here, it's not even a merge. You pretty much take that as just a time point which binds together your previous state and you extract your data from incoming, and you don't merge, you just commit that state. But the history looks like that. So if you look into many projects, in many repositories in data lab, you'll see similar uh, situation. And that Git Annex branch is just tracks your availability. So before anything is committed in any of those branches, we commit availability update of like where those data files are available from. So that's kind of uh, that crude uh, presentation how those pipelines work, but then uh, as an example, we've got all open fMRI datasets crawled and uploaded into our portal on DataLab. This is from 2017, and that's how it looked like. And it was covering about one terabyte of data whenever on our server, which hosted just 700 kilobytes. So the rest was really coming from the web, right? So users would use standardized interface, just data led install, whatever, and get any file regardless where it's coming from, regardless which tarball, regardless what authentication scheme comes from. And you could create your own pipeline. So we have documentation within our docs of data led um, where how to crawl any website where you pretty much create a data set, then you crawl in it configuration, like this URL, download those files, and you can crawl that resource over and over again, getting those updates committed into uh, Git Annex. So altogether, in 2017, comparison to Git and Git Annex of data that was that we already achieved this uh, unified um, access to data resources, but also what was interesting feature is that we could uh, seamlessly operate across data set boundaries. We decided to use, after actually trying different alternatives, we decided to use Git submodules mechanism, which is standard, how to bind different data sets together. And with DataLed, it's really easy to forget that there is submodules, but just, oh, give me this file which comes from some subpath within submodule. So it made, made it really easy. And we added some metadata support and aggregation. So that's kind of 
crude comparison of data lab to Git and Gitanix. And if you want to discover more, at least for Philip, it was really eye-opening talk, he said. Oh, now I realize what is data lab. <laughs> that was in 2020 at FOSDEM. Michael gave a presentation, and it's right there on YouTube for you to uh, view. So while working on data lab, we came to some realizations of its shortcomings or maybe what we've done correctly. One of them was that Git and Gitanix are great, right? So I just love those technologies because they look really complicated, like it's impossible to, to, to explain to clinician how they work. But if you look inside, like it's like objects and references and both of them just about that and formalizing how you store them. So it's, if you get a little bit of inside understanding of those technologies, they're great and really simple actually. But also what we realized is data lab is not just crawler or data distribution, which was our original use case, but we can manage data with it. So it, we don't have to use those external resources. We can manage our own data, private data, without sharing it outside. So it's kind of answering questions uh, in the audience, right? It's like, how do we use data lab for private stuff? You just don't share it. Like it's with Git, you could use it locally, don't share that repository, you have it all privately, but then you still manage your repositories locally and you take all those benefits. Another problem was that data level was domain born, in a sense, it came from neuroscience. So we had lots of craft which is kind of in data led but neuroscience specific. So altogether it became feature creep, right? So we have crawler, we have data management platform, we have metadata management, we have all kinds of stuff in there and it became they kind of, it, it was hard to extend data lab. It's just one monolithic project, right? And user facing documentation was lacking. So that was our, our state in 2017, 18-ish. So that's how data lab extensions mechanism was born. And uh, Michael was really actively pushing it, and I was like, oh, no, no, let's, let's not do those revolutionary things. But that's what happened, you know? We, uh, there was, I don't remember if template was born first, but pretty much now anybody could create a repository using this repository as a template and you'll have your own data led extension templated which is like using contemporary Python packaging technique so you don't have to do it yourself. And it's easy to establish collection of your own commands which will become part of data led namespace. So it, like in Git, you know, it's really easy to create git dash whatever, that whatever becomes a command of git Right, so git space whatever would work. In our case, you need to do more. You need to create Python project and install it. And you will benefit from unit tests and all other kind of technologies which kind of come with it. And initial set of extensions was we took those pieces of data led and put them into extensions, data led crawler, deprecated, like functionality which we want to deprecate and don't want kind of carry it through the years. And data led revolution. And that's what was Kyle's kind of monumental contribution to the project that he managed to merge data led revolution back into the data led core. So uh, extensions gave us a way to experiment, right? To create something with which we experiment and then put it back into data led. And data led core or main repository became just generic command line tool which builds on top of Git, Git Annex. It provides you general version control stuff and there is no neuroimaging specific stuff in data led. So don't take data led as neuro tool. Unless you install extensions, there is nothing neuro about it. But you could extend it with extensions. And since then, there is a number of extensions which were born. So next data led revolution for you, Kyle, if you decide to contribute again. There is data led next. We want to put it back into data lab at some point. Yeah, so there is all those extensions which extend data lab and you can install only what you need for your solutions or you could come up with your own. Okay, let's get back to these realizations and shortcomings and the last one was user-friendly documentation was like, and I believe Greg here was like giving talks and it's like data lab is great but nobody can use it because there is no documentation. And then he ad admitted that like, oh, there is handbook now data led people, they came out and just flooded us with documentation. Like we said that they don't have it, here you go. You have like, I don't remember how many pages now, but it's, huh? Six hundreds, hundreds of, so good night sleep reading. <laughs> have problem falling asleep, read some, you know, it will deposit, it will deposit. So all together, data led for users became like, you know, really good solution to abstract away from tedious I.O. data management and harmonize it across different infrastructure, provide guarantees of data integrity, 
uh, and there is awesome documentation, and there is hours of video enrichment material. So it's like again, instead of watching some, you know, middle age crisis solving solutions, look, watch YouTube videos of data lab. You know, they're great. There are rabbits there. It, it, it's all wonderful. And you could collaborate, right? And we fulfilled the original promise of data distribution. We have now data sets that data that work, which covers over 500 terabytes of data from different resources. Through unified interface, you could get them uh, from that distribution. And it even swallowed Singularity Hub. Did anybody, there are old enough people, did you use Singularity Hub at some point? Anybody? Yeah? So now we have it embedded in our collection of data led data sets. So if, when you do singularity pool, it comes from us. Just for your information. Okay. So, and with that, uh, people started to use data led for various solutions. So, Open Neuro, instead of doing how they did it in Open FMRI tables, they now use Git Annex natively in the background. We facilitated and established uh, Yoda principles in which how you kind of modularize your collection of data sets. Then um, in Dendy, we use it squashed it all out. So all those 500 terabytes available as GitHub repositories covering all those terabytes of data and billions of files, I think, over there. They're all on GitHub and everything uploaded to Dropbox. All those terabytes, I'm just saying. Okay, and uh, people created reproducible and open science publications like this one. You could reproduce the entire publication. It comes from Git Annex, and th there is more advanced ones like that. But for developers, it became kind of the sandwich, right? I promised you a sandwich. It's lots of technologies bundled together. How do we ensure that it all works together nicely? And there is entire ecosystem, right? Dependencies between all those components, and how do we make sure that it worked correctly, because you don't use tool which doesn't have give you ability to verify that it works nicely. So we run a lot of CI. There is a lot of uh, unit testing, integration testing. We test against extensions. We do shell checking, code spelling. And then we also build Git Annex itself. Every day, we take fresh Git Annex, build all those versions across different platforms, and I get that email which gives me a summary. How many of those are passing or failed, and I can immediately go to any of those builds. And uh, also we have a tool, Continuous, which you are welcome to use from simple configuration. You can get archive of all those CI logs for your repositories. We use it in Dendy, we use it in Datalet, so you could git grab, I told you, I love git grab, uh, and find whatever was wrong with it in the past. And pretty much, oh, we have also Datalet installer, which simplifies installation of Gitanix, Datalet, Arclone, and with one command, you could create your own mini Conda installation with everything. So if you read handbook, that's the way it tells you to install Datalet. So overall, in summary, now it should be like Germany sandwich in the background. That's what ChatGPT drew for me. I don't know. It doesn't look really German, but here you go. So data led ecosystem provides you core data led package, bunch of extensions which you can also develop, which will provide domain specific or project specific implementations. There is over a decade of successful collaboration between us in data led with Joy and many projects actually outside which are related to data led or Git Annex. And um, we provide distribution of Git Annex builds and taking care about many projects in those distributions like data led, or Debian, NeuroDebian and ContaForge also. So welcome to data led land and have fun at the conference. I hope that we'll establish more uh, dialogues in the audience, and I want just to acknowledge everybody who contributed and all those wonderful funders who gave us money to make it happen. Thank you very much. <laughs>